Welcome to the Layman Seminary. Today we're continuing the debate preparation for my debate with uh, C.J. Cox, Synagogue, as you can see in the screen here. Um, it's in a matter of a few days, um, this Saturday. And uh, um, I, uh, I, as I was going through preparing my slides and going through all my interactions with them and stuff, I found this screenshot and these things that I mentioned and it reminded me of some things, and I felt like that I need to uh, bring this up to the forefront now so that y'all get a context for this. And then later on, we'll pick up on the um, the James 2 video, our, our initial interaction, and then the one, the panel discussion that led up to this. So let me just show y'all what's going on here. Okay, this is on Jamie's channel. Y'all listen to this, guys. Bombed, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> just... Not real chip, uh, chipper this morning, this uh, afternoon. How are you don't doing? first start talking about sleep? me at first, but this no. was four months ago. <laughs> no, after the, I did not. After the James panel discussion. So this is, you're going to see a little bit of the heart of CJ Cox. He's going to be making unguarded comments. And this is important because whenever he debates, you know, he has all these polished comments and things like this. But I want you to see what he really thinks about me and my position um i was up till five o'clock in the morning and then well obviously right because we were doing that whole open room and, yeah that was interesting yeah it man i i don't know what happened? What what was you? I told I sent you a message. Did you hear the message about what I think was going on? And I said it in the stream too. Do you think that's right, or do you think that I'm missing something? Is there some what was going on there? Well, if I if I can be bold, which when am I ever not right? And that's one of his catchphrases. And sir, if if I may be bold, you know, if I can be bold, you know, um, so yeah, that's just one of his catchphrases. Um, I, I don't find it coincidental that out of 10 panelists, two, two free gracers were on the panel and two people, both of which were the free gracers misunderstood the point. Okay. Now what he's basically saying is that us free gracers didn't get it. And I don't know if he was talking about SFT if Justin was in that or not, or uh, but he is definitely talking about me. And he says I misunderstood the point. I could show you later on where I clearly uh, steel man his argument and tell you the point. And then he says, well, now I, I'm, I'm really concerned. And I talked about this in a previous debate preparation video. But um, so anyway, just listen to this, guys. Uh, I would point out, by the way, that Christopher Silvius and Donnie are both close to free gracers but not free gracers in fact i think donnie is more of a provisionist and um christopher silvius i don't know if he is free grace or not but the way he spoke last night seemed like he is probably closer to yeah. provisionist also okay so he's talking about christopher and sft were on the side and he's probably talking about justin and i being free grace um but i don't think that's coincidental because and look, so he makes it sound like uh, is he it, when he says I don't think it's coincidental does he mean like did we stack the deck against him was it rigged or is it that that we're short sighted or we're slow witted why can't we grasp this let's find out what he's actually saying look this is going to sound rude it's going to sound very mean but the thing is the free grace position is an absolute bastardization of the text. Okay, so he's made this assertion that the free grace position is an absolute bastardization of the text. Now, this is what's so ironic about this. CJ does not believe in limited atonement. CJ is what's called a, a Moraldian, okay? Now, this is so important because the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, Lewis Perry Chafer, who we could say is the uh, father of modern free grace, if you will, uh, that was also Presbyterian, 
he was four pointer. Charles Ryrie was four pointer. There were different ones within that. Now I don't know where they held to how they defined those points and things like this, but this is my point. He prides himself in looking like a reformed person, but he doesn't hold a limited atonement, which usually they don't accept you, honestly. And and for years I've I've interacted with, with reformed people on Google Plus and stuff. And uh you know, but I don't, I don't try to pretend like I'm reformed. And so I think CJ has uh, some issues here. I don't really think he's reformed, you know, and, and reform means nothing nowadays. So let's, let's make it clear. He wants to keep the term Calvinist. It's fine. He's a four pointer. Well, the moment, if you are allowing for the possibility of four pointer, you might as well allow for the possibility of redefining the points zero pointer or even free grace so that means that cj may eventually come to the free grace position but it's just so interesting that he he uh views things the way he does at least right now and the only way you can maintain the position is to continuously misread misapply mystify by way all right so so now we're rhyming i guess he wants to be a rapper too right so you got, remember, bastardizing the text, misread, misapply, I think it says spiritify or mythify or I don't know, some kind of I word. They have, oh, well, the Greeks said, yeah, give an example. Okay, now this is a direct attack on me. Well, the Greek says, all right, here we go, guys. Example, they, um, Charles kept saying consistently, and actually Donnie was saying this too, but to be fair, and I don't mean to be rude, but I think Donnie was saying it honestly. In other words, I think if I had an argument with Donnie, even if we came to a disagreement, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be something where I left thinking to myself, this guy is just unwilling to listen. Okay. He says I'm unwilling to listen. That's the implication. SFT is willing to listen, but I'm unwilling to listen. Okay. Uh you know. That once again, just more assertions. He hasn't established that, you know. Um, if we don't agree with him, we're unwilling to listen. Is is that really all it amounts to? Whereas with Charles, I think it was, but they kept talking about sozo. So okay, so we're talking about the word sozo. Sozo is used five times in the book, and five times it's used to refer to saving of your physical self right well actually most people would say temporal deliverance so it de it doesn't necessarily have to be involved in the physical self like save from fire or something like that but anyway and i was pointing out i don't i don't think that's accurate i think if you look at not only james 2 14 but also james 121 and james no it, okay uh, I'm I'm trying to hit, all right. So number one, the whole debate is about James two. So you bringing up two fourteen, uh, yeah, well that's your assumption, okay? That you're taking can that faith save him as positional? I understand that, but now he's talking about James chapter one. All right, five twenty. Uh, it seems like it's very plainly talking about salvation, right? Now most recently in the Josh Gibbs debate, and we're going to circle back to this. But um, most recently in the Josh Gibbs debate, he conceded that one of these sozos, I think it was in James 4, uh, he agrees is temporal. He don't have a problem with that. So it's good if CJ can change his position and modify things. And I think I can show you that he has to a certain extent. But the thing is, is that when CJ makes a change in his position, he don't tell you, you know. He makes it sound like he's been saying the same message from all along and we're all out of our minds. But hopefully by going back a year ago to our initial uh, interaction and even this right now, you can see what's going on. Um, And the argument there then pivots. It's not because it starts with, um, well, if you look at the usage of Sozo by James, it's you know, something that's only experiential. And then when you point out, no, this actually def definitely reads like something that is salvific. 
Okay, now what's so interesting about this is that we were actually the ones that were pointing out that the word brought us forth in James chapter one was positional. And he then he copped out and he said, well, brethren doesn't necessarily mean that the people were saved. And well, and, and I don't want to miscount him because he's got a more nuanced view than that. But we're going to get back to that. Then it becomes, okay, well, over here in verse three, he says the word brethren, and so therefore, and, and that was that, the reason that ended up being such a big hang-up is because that essentially it removes our ability to properly exegete the rest of the text. If okay, here's another assertion. He's saying that if we take the position that brother refers to a brother, then that removes the possibility to exegete the uh, text. In other words, it almost sounds like he's saying my position is uh, not falsifiable. What the reality is, is that it's his position that's not falsifiable because as, as there are several different reform approaches to this um, where basically they make the argument like like sort of like he does. Well, it's just using a rhetorical feature and it's addressing them as if they were believers, but it's just like a pastor would address the congregation, even though there may be unbelievers in the audience or something like that, you know, um, he, You'll see this. If we assume on the basis of James' use of the word brethren, that every single person he's talking to is saved, and that he assumes that every single person he's talking to is saved, which is not true, I don't think. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? After after I deal with the main issue, what I'm going to show you in this little clip of video, because we're not going to listen to all this, because he's not talking about all of this all the way throughout, is I'm going to show you another clip from the Gibbs debate. And whenever I ask the question, and he says, well, that was never my position. So we'll see about that, guys. Let's see how many times CJ can change his mind. And nothing wrong with change your mind, but at least admit it. Tell me when you make a difference, you know, in your position. Like, I don't think James intended that at all. I don't think we would intend that at all if we wrote to a body of believers. Although we would obviously operate under the assumption that they were truly believers. Um. But I digress on that. Right? If, if that's what's painting our whole perspective, we can't say that this is talking about salvation because here in verse three of chapter one, it used the word brethren. Therefore, all the other instances, verse 21 of chapter one, verse 14 of chapter two, verse 20 of chapter five, have to be referring to believers. It's like, well, we can't go anywhere with this. We well, first off, this uh, this type of argument makes no sense. Let me tell you why. If God gives you a command, which he does in James chapter 1, count it all joy whenever you go through various trials, only believers have the Holy Spirit, and therefore only believers have the ability to please the Lord. So there's tons of implicit arguments for why we believe that the audience is saved. So he's just making this, oh, well, we're just assuming we see the word brethren, and therefore they must be saved. And, and and that's a cheap approach, what he's doing here. We're we're hamstrung by our right. inability to understand James's addressing of a crowd, right? Um Right. He's saying he's saying we're the ones that if we decide to brother that we, we can't we can't consider the possibility he's addressing a crowd. Well, it's the same way around. If if he makes the argument, he's making an argument, he can't make the argument that there are believers in the audience, you know, you can't do that necessarily. And, and, and I disagree with that approach. And to be honest with you, I just, I think that's what the free gracer has to do. Like it's the only way that they can back up what they're saying. Cause if. Okay. So the only way that we can back up what we're saying is assume that the word brethren means brethren. Is that what he's saying? You just read James one twenty one in its context. Yeah, if you read James 21 in your context, what do you find out? The very first verse, or at least after I mentioned scattered tribes, says, count it all joy. It's an imperative. That means they had the ability to do the command. For example, um, therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly. He's mentioning a command. He's mentioning things to do. Now, I think there's an issue there with the participle, um, but the point is, is that he should be able to recognize that only believers can please the Lord, have the Holy Spirit. 
being reformed in his sense, he thinks a person so depraved that they have to be irresistibly regenerated and then given the gift of faith so that they can please the Lord. So why would he why would he not embrace the idea that if a command is given to a believer, then uh, uh, then it, I mean if a command is given to a person, then that person is a believer. The reason being is because his reformed theology will not allow him to, because in his view, there is elect and there's unelect. And the people may look saved, they may think they're saved, they may have temporary faith, they may have spurious faith pseudo faith whatever terms you do that but only if they persevere to the end you know will it be known whether they're saved or not we accept the word planted in you which can save you i mean that's clearly talking about salvation what yes it's clearly talking about salvation experiential salvation uh, not positional salvation okay if you want if you want a positional concept then go back to where it says he brought us forth it's talking about yeah yeah i i I, it's i think i fully see the issue here that you're raising i jamie doesn't fully see anything he's a yes man anytime he's talking to somebody he's ever learning never coming to the knowledge of the truth he'll agree with them he'll have a light that comes on and the next thing you know he's dim right back on daniel chapter nine and right back on teaching the law and things like that so don't take it into consideration whenever jamie seems to be agreeing you know because jamie changes his mind all the time more so better now uh, not that i knew it's totally and it talks about that in james a double uh minded person is unstable in all their ways uh or ephesians 4 tossed to and fro by every wind and waver doctrine except the reality is he's not being tossed to and fro from other ways he's just he's just Given lip service while he's in discussion with other people, but he goes right back to uh, to SDA doctrine. Totally missing it, but yeah, it's 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 if you just re let the Bible, if you let like it's why I'm compelled to say certain times like let the Bible speak, like be taught by Scripture. Don't don't go you know using it like and then forcing things on it. Um, it's not to say that that position is necessarily wrong. Um, it's just to say like. This is a really big issue I see with people, even people that are less like this way, you know, I think. And I'm not even I'm not even getting to the theological. I know I've been dealing with the theological and doctrinal stuff, but I'm really going to get into this accusation he brings against me. Um, if you ever you I, and I find this to be so true in my own life and it's kind of it can be embarrassing or humbling, like actually humbling. And like where if you st most of the times, like if you like anytime you see something in somebody else that you think is like a like a quality that they'd maybe be better without you. It's probably a good idea to like, like check yourself really well. Like, cause you're probably, you're probably just kind of seeing, it's likely that you may, it's possible you may be seeing something in them that, that you're struggling with yourself and you're kind of, it's like a, a way of projecting now, not always, of course, but I've learned that a lot of ways, you know, and it's like, come on, you man. know, how do you help somebody with and not help you? You got to help yourself first, I guess. I don't know what I'm saying. It's just, yeah, they're smart. I, hopefully. You'll notice when Jamie goes, it sounds like he's taking a hit of a joint. Maybe he just smokes. I don't know. Um, but uh, I just want you all to be aware of that. Yeah, I think, I don't know. What did Charles say about that? Uh, well, we, me and Charles were never able to get past the brethren point. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Charles was because, and, and I actually I even pointed this out to Fro because Fro asked if it would be possible for us to get back to James two in our short amount of time because there was only like twenty or some odd minutes left before we hit the three hour mark and we ended up going thirty thirty minutes over the three hour mark anyway. I'm gonna go ahead and play the James two part, uh, at least the parts where uh, CJ and I are going back and forth um, after I po uh, play the Gibbs part from the most recent. Because I just I just want y'all to see that there is some changes that have gone about, and I think we need to admit them at least. But Fro was you know wanting to respect the time that was originally allotted, and so he asked you know can we go back to James two for a moment because I feel like Charles and Jay have been arguing on James one three for quite some time, and and I told him I was like I'm I'm totally fine with that, but we got to understand. Me and, you know, 
Graham and Kevin and even Fro, because the Catholic opinion is going to be closer to the Reformed opinion than the Free Grace opinion is, as far as... <laughs> Y'all hear that, guys? The Catholic opinion is going to be closer to the Reformed opinion rather than Free Grace. So, uh, there are people that make that argument within Free Grace camp, you know, that, that the Reformed theology has not Reformed enough. But, anyway. As James is concerned... Um, not as far as works is concerned, but as far as James is concerned. Um, well, actually, he's wrong about that. The uh, As we know from the St. Genis debate with Wilkin, in James chapter 2, the, the, um, the Catholic position takes it as justification uh, by, by works or whatever, you know, before men, or however you want to put it. Uh, but the, the problem is they take it as sanctification just like me. But the issue is, is they think that the sanctification is through the uh, sacraments of the Catholic Church being in a state of grace and all of that stuff. So, no, they don't take it like the Reformed. You know, we're, we're not going to be able to actually do anything with the exegesis here because we're dealing with this assumption well, first off, you're not even putting forth exegesis, okay? You're not. And and that's the whole thing. And this is see, this is why, you know, he made a he made a snide comment earlier, if you want to call it snide, about the Greek. And he's gonna make it again in a minute. But yeah, he's claiming we're not doing exegesis. So which is it? Do you want to do exegesis without the original languages? Is that what you want? Or do you just want to quote the original languages when it when you think it benefits your position? He's talking to people who are absolutely positively saved. And if they're absolutely positively saved, then when it says something like save your souls or can that save you, it can't be referring to salvation because they're already saved. Right. Yeah, right. And why is that a problem? It, even if it, if the reformed person assumed this one thing, if God revealed who the elect were, and the elect knew who they were, let's put it that way, and and most people would say they do, I guess. I mean, they think they're saved. Then um, they would have no problem saying that the passages about being saved don't apply to me because I'm already saved. So what is your point about saying that, oh, because the free grace points out based on contextual and structural indicators uh, uh, that they're already saved, so the passage doesn't refer to a uh, uh, position of salvation? You believe the same thing. The only one that doesn't believe the same thing is the Armenian that believes you can lose your salvation. And so therefore they would say, well, just because you have salvation now, it still can refer to the fact that you could lose your salvation or perhaps even regain it. Right. This is a problem. This is bringing to the text of presupposition. Yeah, and what are you bringing? I think I called him that. He was teasing him. I was like, oh, it's okay, Charles. Just just own it, man. You're, you are a free grace presuppositionalist. And what's the problem with that? Everybody has, pre, everybody has presuppositions and pre-understanding. I don't have a problem with that. What are your presuppositions? That's exactly right. And so then when we move on. Okay, so wait a minute. You got you got um, the reform guy saying that the Catholics are closer when it comes to James. And now you got uh, Jamie, the SDA, bringing up about presup. And here's a reform guy. And I don't know uh, what his what his approach to apologetics are, but a lot of reform guys are presup. So even if I was pre-sub, you know, that would be closer to in line to reform theology than it would be to uh, anything else. But see, that's what I'm saying. They're they're arbitrarily deciding uh, when to use these terms of accusations against me and others, you know, of our tribe or whatever. On then to James two fourteen or James five twenty, which is another place that was important because of the usage of the word sozo um he's already got in the back of his mind a decision james is written only to holy ghost Phil. and you got already in the back of your mind that well just as you got the old testament made a, a theocracy of believers and unbelievers you have the elect and unlect and the only way you're going to know it is you persevere 
You have the also in your mind that they're using rhetorical strategies to address the believers. So you have a you have a starting point as well. Build on their way to heaven. Nobody can take them out of the Father's hand. Believers, and if that's not true, if that if James is not intending for his work to be understood that way, then all of a sudden. We have a huge open door here in regards to how we can interpret these verses. It's not a huge open door. It's just the most of the intent of scripture is to written for believers for edification, for discipleship and stuff. And and so it, it, he's he's trying to say, oh, there's a there's a huge open door, you know, a slippery slope. What are we going to let in? You know, he, he's just scared, honestly. He's scared that that this this position of ours undermines his position. He can't beat the chart. Um, and I don't mean open door in the sense of like you know it's just anything goes, but I mean open door in the sense of that like we're not we're no longer constricted to this hallway, right? A hallway you got two destinations: the front and. So he's talking about an, uh, uh, limits of on interpret interpretive controls. So his limited interpretive control is his reformed theology. That that's what places limits on the text for him. My limits on interpretive control are based on what I see in the text. You know, that's my assumption. That's my assertion. You know, some people say, well, no, you got your own tradition and theology, and I'm not denying that. But my goal is to be to the text, and y'all decide if I stay true to that goal. In the back. That's it. Um but that's not the case if we get rid of that assumption, right? It's more like a um more like an open room, so to speak. You can move to one corner or the other and kind of explore for a little bit to figure out where exactly you know you belong to for lack of a better term. Um and to be honest, I think this is a consistent problem. Uh, and let me just give an example outside of James. So um first John says they went out from us right yeah this is this is i gave one interpretive option that i know of that is my position about that that's referring to the apostolic circle which is another passage that we clashed on about a year ago um you know there are other options and stuff like that um and he's going to be talking about how you got to trace the wean you got to make decisions and all that and, and that's fine but they use that passage to say that, that if a person doesn't persevere, it shows that they were never saved. To prove that they were not of us, right? Um, and the claim of the free gracer is this isn't specifically referring to the, um, to the believer in general. It's referring to the apostles alone. That's just absolutely not true. Right. So when you look at the very, very beginning of first John, because it's first John 219 that says they went out from us uh, so that would be made manifest that they were not of us. Right. Well, if you look at first John one, it starts thus, that which was from the beginning, which we had heard, which we had seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched this. We proclaim concerning the word of life. Sounds like he's talking about the apostles alone. Right. Keep going. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I'm going to invite my friend in, uh, and we're, we're going to see how this works. I've never done this before, not while I've been live recording. So, all right, so I need to send a Zoom link. Um, participants, invite, copy link, and send it to my wife, and I can get it from there. All right. Sorry for the dead air, guys. All right. So we'll continue while we're waiting to see if he shows up. 
All right, share my screen, share the sound. I'm back to where we are. Complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, notice how he... So what he's going to do is he's going to say the we, the, uh, earlier that was the apostles. And he's going to say, well, the, if the we confess, is that talking about all believers or just some? And there and there's more than one way to look at that. But still, um, I I don't think, because you'll see a shift. He'll say, we proclaim to you. There's other people. There's a distinction whenever it shifts from the we to the us to y'all and all of that. He's using the word we. He's kind of switched a little bit here, right? If we claim to have fellowship. And see, in a debate, let's say if we debated John too, right? I'm going to give all the free grace positions on that. You know, just because I give you my current belief doesn't mean I'm not going to give you other free grace positions on it. And so, uh, CJ, don't think that just because you knock down my current view of things that you knock down free grace, you know. I'm going to give you the the gambit. But he's writing to this group of people who he's teaching this to. So the we has now changed from the people writing it to the group as a whole being addressed. If we claim to have fellowship with him, that includes the church he's talking to, not just a himself. great example. Did you find that since last night or did you read that one last night? That's a like a, the best example I can imagine so far. Um. Well, I've actually read this one to... Um, to Charles before because we've had the dispute before on uh they went out from us to yes, prove they we went have. out of and us. I'll be playing that uh, later. And, and he's claimed before that this is the you know that this was the apostles he's saying they went out from the apostles to prove that they were not of the apostles um and I was pointing out to him no that's not that's not what is actually true it, what you're essentially doing is you're taking verses one through five and the usage of we there and applying it to the rest of the text when if you move on to verse six and so forth he clearly changes the way he's using we to refer to. And I'm not going to focus on trying to defend my interpretation of that right now. Maybe when we walk through that on the other older video. But right now I'm just letting it play so you can see uh, how disturbed he was after the James 2 panel. To the group of believers who he's speaking to. And he includes himself with them because he assumes that they're all fellow believers. Um. Which, of course, is is uh, kind of in line with what we were talking about uh, before, right? Here's another one. He says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's not saying if the apostles confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive the apostles and purify the apostles from all unrighteousness. He's saying... But see, even in that, notice there's a distinction here between we and us. And he skipped over in one three where it says, these things we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us and, and so on. So anyway. Christians. If Christians confess their sins, then he is faithful and just and will forgive Christians of their sins and purify Christians from all unrighteousness, right? If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and the word is not of us. It's not if the apostles claim that they didn't uh sin then they're liars it's if Wait, human CJ, beings cj is this saying you have to you have to you have to actually repent see this is jamie trying to bring in his works um gospel stuff or work sanctification stuff either way he's always going to try to slant things well you know what's interesting about that that's another one that we it gets kind of dicey with free there's four views within free grace on repentance. So just be careful how you, how you reply. Gracers, because they, they would say, no, you don't have to repent. And to be honest with you, I don't know what turning to Christ is, if not repentance. What do you mean by turning from Christ? Now, you know, they'll say, okay, well, if you haven't repented of each individual thing you've ever done, that's like, okay, I, that's, I think, a misuse of the terminology for repent here, right? Finally, we agree on something. So what he just said is that whenever you're talking about salvation, you don't have to turn from individual sins to be saved. Okay? 
th that's great. There's only one free grace position that that talks about turning from individual sins, but it's not for salvation in their view. It's preparatory. So this is good. You know, uh, the issue of that will come up in our debate. Uh, I got to tell my friend how to uh, go to app. Microsoft. Go to Microsoft App Store. Or just do the online version. Follow my link. All right. Sorry, guys. I may not even remember certain sins that I have done. But that's not the point. The point is... My repentance is a changing of mind or a turning away from sin towards Christ. It doesn't make any sense for me to reach out to Christ for salvation if I don't first turn from my sin. What do you mean by turn from your sin? You mean, hey, God, I'm a sinner and I need salvation? Or, hey, God, I'm going to stop doing these sins and I promise to be good? You know, what What? What are you talking about? And turn from my sin, again, is is a heart change it's not so much a behavioral change per se although i think it does manifest in the okay so there now he brought up another uh, view within free grace which is called the internal resolve view of repentance where you may not necessarily see an external change okay so congratulations cj you brought up two possibility of views of repentance that work within free grace so what is your objection let him keep talking guys form of a behavioral change um you know but if we're well let me put it to you this way um christ came to save us from our what from our sins right from the penalty of sin so yes. in order for us to confess that christ is lord to believe on him what are we believing in exactly are we believing he existed well no bart ehrman believes that are we believing that he existed and was also a divine being. Well, the Jehovah's Witness believes that. Are we believing that he existed, was a divine being, and that he's explicitly God? The Catholic believes that. Okay. No, right. we're believing. I, I've dealt with this before, but just really quickly. When I give the gospel, person, work, promise, requirement. If you attack any of these aspects, you have a false gospel. So the person is both divine and human. The work is what he did at the cross. The promise is eternal life, and, and the requirement is faith alone, believing in, in him as God, Savior, substitute, or sacrifice. So him making this argument, well, what are the Catholics? Well, the Catholic, yeah, they get the person right, but they get the work wrong because they add to the work through their sacrificial system, and, they, and therefore they undermine the promise of eternal life. And they also change the requirement. And some of those other groups too as well. Thankfully, I'm not having to debate the Catholic view and stuff. I had to read Sir Genesis' whole book before I do that. In, in particular, that he did exist, yes. He was Messiah, yes. He was divine, yes. He was God, yes. But more specifically than that, that he saved us from our sins that were sinful. And as a result, are in need of a savior, right? So if... if, if if all you have to do to be saved is recognize I'm a sinner and I need a savior. If, if you're willing to admit that, CJ, then congratulations. You have a free grace view of repentance. Well, you don't think you need a savior if you haven't repented. What do you mean by that? It's almost like like the two yeah. are one and the same. Yeah, it's, it's, they're, un, they're unremovable. I would, even, I would even say because we agree with God when we sin – knowing we have a high priest uh who's you know hebrews 8 sort of thing it's like you know it's not about like if we forget to sin, uh, repent on a sin or something we're going to go to hell because we died suddenly you know without repenting of that one sin it, but so jamie's talking about experiential repentance and and cj is talking about positional repentance or preparatory repentance it is i think it is also a continual uh, repentance that brings reform in your life through the power of you know um, Christ's influence or whatever. And so, it, and of course, I'm not saying that to say 
you know, like God's being like, it's every little sin, you know, and I think there's a sense that God covers, but I think God forbid we say that we shouldn't repent, you know, of our sins as they occur, you know, that seems like it's just part of the Christian life, I would say. But yeah, I totally agree with you. Like, what it's like, uh, it's from my perspective, my particular perspective, um, when I hear people say stuff like, like even go so far as to say, like, it's, it's uh, a misunderstanding of the gospel to say you have to repent. It says, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. You know, so if you add something to that, you add something to the gospel. It's like, no, I don't think so. I think. When you believe on the Lord Jesus and you should be saved, the idea of salvation implies you believe in your sin, right? Sin, sin's a reality. You need a savior. You need a real savior. The, that's not a problem. But the issue is, is that he's trying to change what that actually means. I think that's, I think that's, that's like a race. In other words, it's like a race to the bottom. It's like people saying, you know, you know, lessening it, making it less and less and less to the point where it's not what it's supposed to be anymore. You know what I mean? I mean, you feel free to disagree with that. I just feel like that's where it go. It ends up going. I've, I've heard like Stephen Anderson kind of say that in a sense, like before I think, and I'm not, I can't really recall for sure exactly what he said, but I've heard people say that, like, if you think you have to repent, to be to believe in Christ, then you know you're adding to the gospel, and you essentially don't understand the gospel. And I think that's like, it's like, what do you even say to that? I, I don't, you know, there, there's some sense where we should we can like balance each other out from going too far in towards the ditch or whatever. I think on some level, but like, that's why I just think people we should start like, what what can people accept with differences between each other? Um, well, like holding fast to at least start and saying like, yeah, that person believes justification by faith and what it means to believe that, like on some, at least on some basic level. Well, and I think the big problem with it too, or the biggest problem, I should say, because there's a lot. I, I got to be honest, the more I'm moving forward with this, the more I'm kind of thinking, and I mean, you guys all know, at least, well, you know, at least. Brother Timothy's in the live chat. He's a consistent watcher, so he would likely know as well. But I guess not everybody on your channel watching would know. But most of you know that I am very, very trepidatious with terms like heresy. But I got to be honest with you. I find it very difficult. Okay, so he's basically saying that free grace is heresy. One second, guys. I got to send this email to my friend. And uh, um, and then I'll get right back at it. Sorry for the dead air, guys. He had to make such a hard email. Got it. All right. Okay. So now I'm going back. I'm going to share my screen again. Share the sound. And we're back to where we were. Oh, that's not it. To think free grace is... So he's basically saying free grace is heresy. All right? So anyway, let's see how he goes with this. Is anything other than heterodox? The more that we get into, because, you, you know, the, the scripture does warn specifically about this kind of reasoning, uh, you know, saying things like, well, should we, when Paul says, well, should we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That passage concerns sanctification. Okay. Hey, Trey. Let me stop sharing my screen, get him in here. His audio is connecting right now. Mm. 
Uh, it's connecting to audio. Once his audio connects, we can continue. I guess I could. Trey, can you hear me? Hello, Trey? I'm going to pause the recording just for now. Hey, Trey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so we're, I'm recording right now, and this will go on YouTube, okay? And uh, what I'm doing is I'm reviewing these accusations against the guy that, that, that I'm going to be debating, all right? Are y'all on video? No, you're on video. You don't have the camera on or nothing. I don't have my camera on. But can you see okay. me? Yeah, no. Yeah, no. What's that mean? <laughs> no, no. Are you looking at it? You don't see me sharing my screen. Yeah, I see your screen. I don't see you. Well, I don't want you to see me. I want you to uh -oh. see my screen. Okay, yeah, I see your screen. All right. Let me make sure I got the sound on so you can hear it. Okay, so this guy right here with the goatee, this is Synecog or CJ Cox. I'll be debating him. This is a, a, an SDA guy that's um that uh um was interviewing him after a panel discussion that we had on james chapter two okay feel free to interrupt and share your observations by the way guys trey is free grace trey knows the original languages we studied it together for years um he's a little rusty you know um but yeah and janet will be joining us too um uh -huh. He's washing clothes, I think, right now. Um, you know, or those who turn the uh, gospel into lasciviousness. So um, right now he's saying that free grace is heresy, okay, basically. And he's mentioning Romans chapter 6, right, about grace may abound. Uh -huh. What should we do that we may sin? Do you have any thoughts about that? No, I just want to listen for a little bit first. All right, cool. Um, or, or the you know the Nicolaitans who are or explicitly spoken to be outside of the faith. Okay, now we're Nicolaitans, right? We're in Revelation, <laughs> right? And, and what is it that they're doing? They're essentially living debaucherously and saying, "Well, it's all fine and dandy and super swell because Jesus Christ died for our sins." Um. Well, first off, he's attacking antinomianism, and free grace does not teach antinomianism, neither in the experiential sense or even in the positional sense, so that doesn't follow. And of course, I know, Trey, you know the chart, but just for the benefit of other people, our chart, position, experience, yeah. and ultimate. So he's talking about antinomianism. And he's talking about what you can do after being saved. So that's experiential antinomianism. But we believe that there are laws, there's codes for a person to follow the Christ code, the law of Christ, whatever term you want to use. So we believe in that for sanctification, experiential sanctification. And, and, and this is the thing, we're not even positionally antinomian because... Uh, we believe that there's a command to believe the gospel. And if you obey that command, you're saved. So no one can even accuse us of being positionally antinomian. Um, so I point that out a lot. So the whole charge of antinomianism does not rest on free grace. You can rest it on hyper grace right here. You know, the ones that don't think you need to confess your sin, that God doesn't discipline and all of that. You can put it on hyper grace, but you can't put it on free grace. And it's like, I don't, I mean, do we understand how dangerous that is? Like Jim Jones, for example. Okay, guilty by association. And, and now he's going into Jim Jones. You know, the Kool -Aid one, I think it was the one that they drank the Kool-Aid and, and yeah. they all died. <laughs> so he's telling us, don't drink the Kool-Aid of free grace. Jim Jones confessed Jesus was Lord. Um, Jim Jones believed in an orthodox understanding of scripture 
Well, then if James Jones believe the gospel, he'll, he'll be in heaven. Same thing with Ted Bundy. Everybody's talking about Ted Bundy right now, right? No, Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm sorry, not Ted Bundy, but maybe him too. But everybody's talking about it. Was Jim, Jeffrey Dahmer saved, you know, because his pastor has interviews and stuff online. He believed in an orthodox understanding of the Trinity. All the things that all the different people like to say are salvific, right? As far as pure head knowledge. Uh, and, and I don't necessarily even agree that all of these. There it is to charge a head knowledge and heart knowledge when there's no such thing, you know. Things are necessary for salvation per se. Uh, the gospel itself is. But just roll with me for a minute. Jim Jones confessed all that stuff and recognized, hey, you know what? If I put myself in this high-ranking position, and especially if I do it in the middle of Brazil, where nobody can find me, um, or Argentina, or whatever South American country he was in. Now, notice this reformed person is claiming to know the motives of Jim Jones and what the internal workings of Jim Jones, which is inconsistent with the reform position because if they're to be consistent, they don't even know whether they're saved or not. I can get myself a lot of power. I can have complete and total dominance over this whole group of people. I can take their wives uh, and say that it's divinely mandated for me to take their wives. I can take their children and make them slaves and say that it's divinely mandated. Uh, you know, I can tell, uh, you know, I can assassinate political officials and say that it's on all the different stuff that Jim Jones did, even up to mass suicide. And the free gracer would have to confess if he had the proper head knowledge that that man was saved. And I go over this a lot of times. I say that salvation is based on the supernatural facts. So, you know, this goes back to the whole mental ascent thing. But I use the term supernatural facts because only the Holy Spirit reveals that Jesus Christ is God, that he's the Lord and he's the Savior. So supernatural facts, which he's reducing to mental head knowledge. Well, that actually cheapens the work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, according to John chapter 16, convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So when it's not an issue of the facts. It's an issue of the Holy Spirit's ministry and whether you're going to respond to the light that you're given. And I mean, what are you to do with that? I, I mean, I don't know how I could look at that and say something other than that's heresy. And I say it with... I it's heresy because of what? Because supernatural facts save? Say it with trepidation and with love. But that is... that That's heresy, right? And in, in a Trey, in another discussion with him, we were going over Solomon. And he basically... I think he conceded that Solomon was saved. You know, well, he wrote Ecclesiastics before he died. You know, there's no proof of that. He could have wrote Ecclesiastics in his carnality or went right back into his carnality after that. There's no proof that, that Solomon repented before he died. And you can do that multiple times over. Joel Osteen has, um, Jim Jones was an atheist. Well, I guess I'd have to look into that. My understanding of Jim Jones was that his beliefs were orthodox, but yeah, they started uh, out that way for sure, as I recall. Hey, anybody's welcome to join. Uh, uh, if you disagree or agree, I would love to hear from you and uh, uh, love to meet you. If I don't know you already, hi Ace, hi Doc, Tommy, Tim, Tommy, Tim, can I have some more, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. So yeah, yeah keep going. Uh, well, Trey, I have the free version of Zoom, so that means every 45 minutes they'll kick us, but we'll come right back. <laughs> I mean, but it's it's right, right? Like, or or Brendan Robertson. Brendan Robertson comes out. He's the 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 gay TikTok pastor, right? Who talks about oh, your polyamorous relationships are holy and stuff like that. Let me just speak very frankly with you guys, as somebody who has had um, a insatiable libido in the past 
if I was convinced by my spiritual authorities that my debaucherous sex life could have been deemed holy, um, God never calls sin holy, and neither does free grace. So he's bringing up these people that that are going against the word of God, saying the things that are sin that they're not sin. Free grace doesn't do that. Free grace calls sin, deals with sin. The issue is, is it recognizes that the penalty has already been paid for, and 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 now the issue is is sanctification, fellowship, worship, service, you know, rewards, those things like that. There, I mean, there's no telling what kinds of vile things I could do. And by the way, I'm married. So that means the, not only would those vile... So basically what he's saying here is that if it wasn't for his theological position, he would, his, his sin nature uh, in, 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 concerning his libido, more specifically, would, would, would consume him and, and nothing would be kept in check. So... That could be a possibility that he's scared to think of another position because he's safe. And you'll meet people like this. They come, they go through recovery programs, AA, NA, or whatever, and they think that that program saved them. They think they got, they got to do everything that program says. They got to call the sponsor. They got to do all those things. And if they don't do those things, they're afraid that they're going to relapse, go to prison, whatever it may be. And and they never experience the freedom that they can have in Christ. Not saying they're not saved. It's just they live in bondage. You know, they live in they live in a program instead of in recovery. Honestly, how things be done, uh, in spite of her and her feelings, but also to her, in a very degra uh, degradatory fashion. Right. Um, we'll just speak very frankly. It is degrading and vile to pass a girl around and let everybody get a nice little poke at her. But if I was convinced that that sort of thing was holy, right, I very well might have been actually doing that and saying that it was Jesus endorsed and completely destroying this young woman's life and relegating her to the point of being He's a piece of meat, on a, a slab, on a, uh, right? Tangent. And Brendan Robertson would be endorsing that completely destroying her life, likely destroying her understanding of the gospel, right? Uh, because I would be the the link to Christianity that she has. What does he say? Because she's not a Christian. Say that again? Quote him again? What does he say? He's talking about this guy, Brendan Robertson or whatever, that, that basically teaches that uh, a sinful lifestyle is accepted by God. And he's basically saying that if I did, if I if I believed that my that my uh, debaucherous lifestyle that he previously lived was holy, he would be going buck wild, basically. You know, oh. and he, so uh, he, I think what he's getting to is he would say that the free grace would have to say that a Brent, a Brandon Roderson or Roderson, whatever his name is, uh believe the gospel he's saved and i refuse to believe that he'll say like why can't why can't the devil use a, be a believer i think the devil uses believers all the time i don't think they can be possessed but I, you know you're either going to be a good example or a bad example you have any thoughts about that before we go forward for me yeah well, I was I was thinking I was just thinking I mean I don't, I've never heard anybody that teaches free grace talk about so then you can go and do whatever you want it's okay right it saved. doesn't exist so 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 it's just an idealism that argument's just an idealism to me it's, right. it's because you hear the word free grace it's an it's an ideal that you think but I've never heard it I've never heard a preacher say you, you're saved by grace through faith alone but you know. You don't have to obey the, you know, uh, uh, discipleship and, and, you know, the moral laws and, and this and that. I've never heard a preacher say that, but I thought that he was saying that he had heard somebody talk about that. Well, yeah, he's talking about a guy who, who believes that sin's wrong, but he's not free grace. Well, ho well, hopefully anybody who's really um, pursuing a life of faith can tell that that's a false doctrine. I mean, 
Right. It, it's, it's you, you know, know, even a new Christian that's newly saved. I mean, you know, we've seen thousands of them. Yeah. You know, exactly. and we know how they are. They get on fire, you know. And, and, right. And uh, so I what's mean, interesting about this guy is he's had a kind of a gutter type ministry, you know. Yeah. But I think that it, it's his legalism that he thinks is keeping him sober or those around him sober or or whatever. I don't know his whole story. Yeah. And, I mean, and that's, where just, we, that's just not we growing, offer, you know. We offer free grace to those people, you know. Right, right. I mean, if you don't continue to grow, if you don't continue to grow in grace and knowledge, then, you know, you can be uh, Re easily manipulated by the things of the world or, 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 you know, by other ideals and stuff like that. But absolutely. a Christian can be deceived. Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, that's not growing. But and that, you know, and I, I'm glad you brought that up about the deception thing. Yeah, we believe a Christian can be deceived even to the point of apostatizing. But of course, oh, yeah. the reform don't believe that. And you can you can have false doctrines here and there, but you'll never reject Christ. That's what they'll say, you know. Mm. But they had that. And tell me how that worked for Solomon. Well, Solomon was Old Testament. Oh, so you're teaching more than one way of salvation? You know, crazy. Um, Brendan Robertson saved because he's got the proper head knowledge. I mean, really? Are we really going to start going there, right? If he believed the gospel, yes, he's saved. You know, it might be funny, um, sad, funny, or you never know when, when we get to heaven or the judgment seat of Christ. If uh, God has the legalistic Christians in the same group with the uh, the Jeffrey Dahmers, you know, <laughs> said, "Hey." <laughs> I know you don't have a sin nature anymore, and now I want you all to see that y'all are believers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you both had your issues. You know, this guy ate people. You ate people with your uh, self-righteousness, but uh, you're both here, you know? I don't know. That's, that's rough. Joel Osteen, completely confessionally sound. So he brings up all these extremes and he's saying it that free grace opens the door for all of these people possibly being saved. Well, yeah. I mean, that's called grace. The most wicked person can be saved. Completely confessionally sound. But we, of course, have seen the result of his prosperity gospel. Are we going to say that that's just that's cool? It's all good. We never say it's cool or all good. What he's given is all bull right now. This is just a straight up straw man constantly, and and yeah. and, the, and the thing is, this guy is a low, uh, a lightweight contender in debates. He's debated some significant people. Don't get me wrong; he's all over YouTube. Like if I just type in his name on YouTube, you'll see it. You'll see his name all over the place. He's debated a lot of different people. But I don't think anyone's ever really challenged him on his on his BS. Look, God gives does God give objective morality? Is Santa based in Satanism, C. A. Cox? Was the flood of Noah ethical? Uh ethics of God, open theism, eternal security. You know, he's all over the place on here. Uh so, I mean, he's been around and stuff. You can start seeing my debate preparation video showing up. But uh, um, I think that, I think he's allowed people, he's gotten by with being lazy in his arguments. And I think he's about to have to put in some work. Um, But here we go. Under the hood. You I better, you know what I mean? You better. I mean, after all, I mean, um. By one offering, he hath perfect has past tense perfected them that are sanctified. They we're already sanctified. Period. And uh, we're so the guy that's talking believes you can lose your salvation, but he just read a passage that says that we're perfected forever. Positional sanctification. Still there. I'm here. All right. 
are already perfected. Therefore, anything goes. And if you don't believe that, you're lost, CJ. Well, and you know what's funny about that is, you know, you're being sarcastic about it, but let's just be real. That exact thing has come out of the lips of free racers. Jack Smack immediately comes to mind. I don't care too much for Jack Smack's approach because he he uh, thinks that eternal security is the gospel. I think it's the implication of the gospel. Uh, now, I try to emphasize eternal security whenever I give the gospel, but I don't come up to someone and say, hey, you have to believe in the 39 irrevocables to be saved. You know? Huh. <laughs> no one knows what we just said, but you know. <laughs> Uh, and actually, Charles himself, because Charles has oh, yeah. said that uh, he believes that a Christian, meaning a genuinely saved person, could have a single moment of genuine saving faith and could turn around and live as a Satanist for the rest of their life, die in Satanism, and still be saved. And, and I mean, I barely even know what to do with that, right? Like, and it's, it is exactly what I'm talking about. You're essentially saying Matt Dillahunty, Brendan Robertson, Joel Osteen, Jim Jones, all these guys are, that their faith is equally valid. And that, I mean, that is... It has nothing to do with their faith being equally valid. It's the fact that they believed in the Savior. The Savior is the reason that they're saved, not them. What's that? What, what was that um, omnipotence argument? Where it's like, you know, can God make one and one plus three or equal three? You right. know, it's like, it's like, it's it's kind of like one of those kind of arguments, you know? I mean, we don't know if that dude really believed. He could have believed. He could have right. been saved. But he might not have grown. He might not have continued to learn. He, he you know, I mean, like, like we were saying, a Christian could be deceived. They can backslide. He may still be saved. Does he earn rewards? No. Right. Yeah. Incredibly destructive, both to the human person here and... So how destructive is it to tell people you don't know whether you're saved unless you persevere, you know? Which is more destructive? Because if they, if they sin and fall back, they're going to be like, well, I must not be saved. And then that's a that's a ruin right there, too. You know, they, they fall into a habitual pattern again because they're like well i guess i just really wasn't saved yeah we've met people like that we have we have talked to them plenty yeah yeah and they argue with us about it we're like no man you know do you believe you yeah yeah but you know i, I did this well it, you <laughs> yeah. know if we confess our sins <coughs> yep and to the soul and and you know, you even kind of heard it a little bit last night. He was challenged with Matthew 25, separating the goats from the sheep. What's your, um, before he even speaks, because you have no context for any of this discussion, what is your view of Matthew 25, uh, the goats and the sheep, Trey? Just real in a nutshell. Oh, geez, it's been so long, dude. Uh, uh, I don't remember the arguments, man, honestly. Well, no, just give me your first impression. What do you know about the goats and the sheep? <sighs> um, Step out on faith. What's a goat think. and what's a sheep? Let's start there. Well, I don't know, dude. Okay, all right. I don't uh, know. I really don't know. It's okay. It's all right. I forgot the. I, I totally forgot that whole argument. It's been a while, dude, since I've been around and talked to. Well, I know people but of faith. You, just, you know what I'm saying? Just, like I was saying, is a sheep a good thing or a bad thing? Well, the sheep is a good thing. Okay. What about goats? I don't know. I don't know about goats. All right. So, so you're. Can you you're, milk you're, a goat? So you're you're pro sheep, but you you're you're you don't know about goats, right? I don't know about goats. Okay, all right. So if you have a judgment between the goat and the sheep, you have a you already said sheep are good, right? So yeah. that most people would say goats are bad, right? Oh, Janet's in. Let's see what Janet can tell us about it. 
Hey, Janet, you here? Asamako. Let me stop sharing for a second. Oh, no. It said user. Me, Who's user. <laughs> Janet, don't do that. You scared me. I thought you were a scammer. Or <laughs> no, I don't know. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Are we... Oh, yes, we're right. recording. We're live right now. So, we're so no, is I... so is the argument over the depart from me for your curse? Who's talking but like, now? That's is the argument right. about hey? Uh, hi, Dave. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I'm sorry for my name because it that's Zoom. Um, it's <laughs> Zoom, not me. Okay, it's Zoom, I'm not you. Okay. Now, while using uh, while fixing this name. Okay. All right. So we'll go back to the sound. Go ahead, Trey. What were you saying? Well, the goat. Well, the goats are unbelievers. Okay, you're saying the goats are unbelievers. Janet, what do well, you know it, about the judgment of the sheep and the goats? Wait, wait, wait! I don't have speaker. I cannot hear you good. Okay. So you think that you think the goats are unbelievers? Okay. Why do you think they're unbelievers? Uh, because I just read. I just reread the parable. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it says they're condemned for what they didn't do, and it says that they're going to go into the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay. And nowhere else in the Bible does that describe a place where fallen Christians would go. Now, fallen Christians will, will weep and have gnashing of teeth, but they don't go to an eternal place of fire where the devil is, you know? Yeah. And I um, mean, it does seem plain, but if there's an argument against that, I'll love to hear it. Well, you 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 know that's all of a discourse. It it probably deals with the tribulation. You know, there's that aspect. Right. But out you also, as you brought up about weeping and gnashing and teeth, right? Dillo's arguments. Uh -huh. Um. So yeah. So that's where we're at right now. And the goats are cast into hellfire. Um. I'm, I am paraphrasing, but I'll go ahead and pull up the exact verse here. So that people can, you know, hear exactly what it is that is being communicated. And again, it's Matthew 25, not the parable of the 10 virgins after that, where he's talking about the goats and the yeah. sheep. The last one. Um, That's the third one, yeah. Yeah. And he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, come, you are uh, you who are blessed by the father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's clearly a reference for uh, to heaven. Right. <laughs> yeah. For I was hungry. You Is that a reference to heaven? Your inheritance. Or it could be the kingdom on earth. Right. A premillennial. This guy, I think, is premillennial. <sighs> I think he's actually pre-trib also. That's what I'm saying. He's 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 a uh, he's a Amorelian, you know, that just needs to stop calling himself a Calvinist because he thinks it's cool, and and consider actually the claims of free grace. He gave me something to eat. And if he doesn't become totally, you know, sovereign grace is another option as well. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. The righteous will answer him, Lord, when did I do these things? Um, and I'm, I did paraphrase that a little bit, but I'm trying to get to the goat's part. And he says, when you um, see a stranger and invite him in or needing clothes and clothe you, uh, when did we see you sick or in prison? King will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of these least of my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then we get to the real interesting part here, the part that he was confronted with. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. These are the goats. Depart from me. You who are cursed. So he says, depart from me, leave the presence of God. You who are cursed, meaning not blessed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And when confronted with that, Fro confronted Charles with that. Charles said that these goats were believers. I mean, and and we can go back and listen to it. And probably what I said is that it's possible they're believers. Uh, 
you know, sometimes I'll give them a, a current view or a current possibility within free grace. And I just like to see them stumble over it. It shocks them because it causes them to question everything, you know. Um, but we'll go back and we'll look at that in a minute. We got 10 minutes for this video. Janet, you there yet? Yeah, I tried to uh, put some picture and I don't know how. So it's okay. I'm, I'm... Go ahead. No, uh, I didn't. No, no, no. It's... So what's the argument for this being um, a, for, for the view that... Uh, these are people who uh, are eternally in the kingdom, but didn't get their inheritance and did get their inheritance. What What is the argument for well, that? Well, I, I have to remember. I think I was just speaking in generalities, but here, I'm going to bring up that debate. I'm reading. Who am I reading? Being uh, a friend of God. Okay. Project, and the scripture was. What? Huh? Can you hear? Yeah. Okay, this is the debate. Roughness? Wherever this occurred Relieved. at. There's before and it was then a, there's It was a before. panel discussion. 2.14 and James 5.20 at least. So first. Go ahead. Something real quick. It does mean that. But... Okay. Well, I have a question for you, Wes. Since James 5.20. Believers. Names and and you can use those proof texts from uh, guy talking to Paul Galilee and, and especially in the Gospels, Catholic. that the works of charity and the justification of Jesus Christ. What makes, what makes, um, somewhere like Romans three and four, whereas the specific part of the Word of God. In fact, I my turn, my turn. Did use the argument that brethren does not refer to everybody by him using we. One possibility is that he's including himself within that, which means that when it says they brought us forth, we know at least one person has been brought forth, and that's the author of the book. Just my turn, my James. turn. Clearly to believers, if you if you just... We can't exegete the text because of this off phrase out here that's saying, oh no. The justification... Everybody who is in Corinth is absolutely saved. And what makes, what makes you say that... that... James, and, and you can use those okay, here here it is. from... Uh, different epistles of Paul and even in and especially in the gospels that the works of charity and the justification of Jesus Christ are intimately related thoughts he said thoughts well, but I nobody mean, knew what he said I'm pre-trib I think that's one area that CJ I and I would, would uh, well, uh, agree with and uh, so I don't view that Matthew 25 referring to the church. But even if it did refer to the church, it's talking about service. It's not talking about how to be saved. Right. It's about, specifically, it's talking about uh, salvation, though, soteriology, like uh, what happens on the last day after throwing a judgment. Right. But well, I don't think you can read the parable between of the, the judgment uh, of the, the judgment of the goat and sheep happened at the end of the tribulation. And there's subclasses within them. You have. You have faithful sheep and you have unfaithful sheep. So if it's about service, then the issue is who's faithful. It's not talking about who's saved. You see, I yeah, I I don't see I don't see that uh being expressed within the uh within the parable or within the whole of the chapter for that matter. And so your basis for saying that they're not saved is what? Uh, based on what Jesus said, well, Jesus' own words, he said, uh, depart from me into the lake of fire, which was prepared for you. I mean, I don't think there's too many more ways to take that. Can you all hear me? Well, it, it's possible. Hello? Hello? Yes, sir, I can hear. Yes, sir, I can hear. I didn't know which one you are in the video or in the present time. <laughs> Trey, you still here? I'm here. All right, which one are you? <laughs> huh? Janet didn't know if I, if I was oh. talking now or if that was in the past in the video. <laughs> so I'm talking now, and this is where you, are you listening to the debate right now? Yeah. All right. Possible it could be hyperbole because weeping and gnashing of teeth 
can refer to deep regret. Cut to pieces can refer to conviction. It's possible. Actually, well, man, it's just, possible it can refer to the judgment seat of Christ. So you just make it unfalsifiable at that point. Uh, I think that the Charles. judgment seat of Christ is falsifiable. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me Charles, Charles, some phrase. Charles, I think you brought something interesting. Falsifiable the wrong way. Falsifiable okay, means that. No, I said that you make it unfalsifiable. Like you, you can't even negate your position. That make like that just just becomes irrelevant because. Explain it's, exactly what you mean that I can't negate my position. Uh, like, but before you do that, you're you just that asserting place. that I can't negate it, but you no, because all you're going to do is shift the goalposts and say that anyone's going to be saved forever. So your definition, so your definition of shifting the goalposts is to rightly distinguish where Scripture fits within the various columns of position, experience, and ultimate. Hey, no, you're just a soteriological precept. That's all, Charles. Charles, there is actually a way of kind of uh, determining this. <laughs> you mentioned on uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth was actually something of deep regret. That's not what's going on. When when the New Testament refers to people weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's actually a reference to the Old Testament that identifies an enemy of God. For instance, uh, when the uh, w when a Jerusalem, and I forget where this is, I'll have to look it up, but Jerusalem at one point is sieged, and the besiegers, who are uh, you could say are the enemies of God, are being depicted as basically gnashing their teeth at God's people, at the uh, at the Israelites. So when the Bible refers to weeping and gnashing of teeth, it is not referring just to deep regret. It is identifying an enemy. I'm not denying that it can be used uh, to refer to enemies and stuff like that, but I'm also mentioning that it can refer to deep regret. It comes down to the context of what's going on. You see, I don't know about that because in the Old Testament, when well, they, when I mean, I have people, resources where we could go in and discuss it, but it's the same resources I told you all about. A, a, a year or what is it, six months? I don't know, ago when we went to these very same passages and I mentioned Final Destiny, but I doubt any of y'all got the book and read it. But, but isn't, it, recently, isn't it a time of fallacy to take one that, word from one part of the Bible and add, it, add the same meaning to a different part and, and yes. ignore the context? Yes, yes. Illegitimate totality transfer or illegitimate right. identity Dude, transfer. <laughs> see, see, I'm stirring you up, bringing it to remembrance, right? Yep position so you know we could go and look at the scholarship but we're going to board everybody else but <laughs> i read it but i did it like that one charles edgar or the ed charles edgar casey i just slept on it and i absorbed it in you read final destiny by jody dillo the i'm like the theoretically yes theoretically meaning <laughs> you're lying how many how many pages was it more than one but less than a thousand Nope, it's twelve hundred. <laughs> nope, lying. you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is lying. It's more, it's more, I'm, than, I'm, a thousand. It's more than a thousand because I think the page itself for a thousand. Yeah, yeah. Was definitely not reading it. And everything else. <laughs> more, than <laughs> than it's more than a thousand. Because All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Yeah, it's it's totally 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 totally. So Justin's free grace. He's a little unstable, but he's free grace. Jamie, of course, S S D A. Praise I am. He's all over the place. SFT, this is his channel. He's free grace. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Final points. Yeah, let's, actually, let's I make, let him snake know. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Bone. And then the have you ever heard the name uh, Francis Turretin? Uh, Trey? Uh, who? Francis Turretin? No. He's a he's a reformed scholar, and that's him right there. I didn't realize he actually came in here. I think that's him. They give it a new name, but uh, a lot of something that out. Then. Oh, that wasn't him. That was another guy going by the um, name. I guess he does have the whole thing about the the Genesis one. Oh, this is talking about. All right, so you got um, a little bit of context for you know, what uh, that one was going about. We got less than one minute, so I'm going to close this one out and we can start another one. Anyway, Janet, you want to say it or you want me to do it? Please do it. Uh, I'm okay. still finding 